Did Pedro Pascal just predict the downfall of society using only his knees? Yes, and I'm about to prove it. Hello, internet! Welcome to Style Theory, the channel that continues to force our editors into making fan cams of me and Pedro Pascal. <laughs> One day you'll notice me, senpai. One day. But why am I talking about him today on Style Theory? Well, at the recent 2023 Met Gala, the internet's favorite meme daddy made headlines by raising his hemlines. You see, the Met Gala is one of the major events of the fashion world that happens every year, with attendees expected to wear outfits that push the limits of what fashion can do. This year had some hits, some misses, and a shocking number of cats. But near the top of everyone's best dressed list was Pedro Pascal, the Mandalorian himself looking absolutely manda glory in a short suit meets schoolboy inspired outfit taken straight from Valentino's winter 2023-24 collection. Except there was just one problem with his fit, the amount of knee that Pedro had on show. Those are some short shorts, my friends. Now, you might think the concern here was, oh my gosh, he's showing off so much skin, think of the children. But that wasn't it. No, far from it. The real concern was that Pedro's short shorts were predicting the collapse of the global economy. <laughs> I am not making this stuff up. You see, back in 1926, in a economist named George Taylor proposed a theory, a legitimate style theory that said that the sale of women's hosiery could be used to track the state of the economy and its stock market. Now, it sounds ridiculous, right? But when you actually stop and listen to his reasoning, the premise makes a good amount of sense. Back in the day, women would buy hosiery to cover their legs in order to stay modest while wearing more revealing garments like skirts, kind of like how everyone tends to default to wearing tights nowadays. But hosiery was kind of an unnecessary expense, you know, an extra item of clothing to buy and wear so you can can show off your legs. Plus, hosiery tended to tear easily and had to be replaced frequently. George Taylor saw this and predicted that more sales of hosiery meant people had more money to spend, which in turn meant that the economy was in a good place. On the other side, when money got tight, women would save their money and buy less hosiery. And as a result, women would wear longer skirts and dresses to hide their legs. Over the years, pantyhose have just largely become a thing of the past, but the basic premise of Taylor's theories remained, and it's transformed into what's now known as the hemline index. When the when economy is up and money's flowing, hems are up and women are showing off their legs. When the economy is down and money's tight, hems are down and legs are covered. So what does any of this have to do with our resident zaddy Pedro Pascal? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's actually a corollary theory to the hemline index that says it's actually the reverse for men. Men show off more leg in times of economic crisis and less leg when the economy's good. Which, if true, just means we're in for a rough ride based on the amount of thigh that Pedro was flashing to those cameras. So color me intrigued. Theorists. Today we're looking at the data to put the hemline index theory to the test. Can the length of a skirt actually predict the rise and fall of the economy? Does seeing a man's knees mean that you're about to get need in the dollar dollar bills? Should I be firing my economic advisor and instead start getting investment advice from the local tailor? That, my friends, is what we aim to figure out today. First stop on our little depression tour, the Roaring Twenties, the time of jazz, prohibition, and economic prosperity. Between 1920 and 1929, the country's total wealth more than doubled. New technology was everywhere. The radio, the automobile, electric washing machines. Coming out of World War I, people had more money than ever to spend, and one way that they were going to be spending it was, of course, on clothing. The flapper look was definitely the defining aesthetic of the decade. Think Velma Kelly from Chicago. <laughs> The flapper trend saw hemlines rising from the floor-length styles of the 1910s to a daring mid-calf length, closer to what modern fashion would call the midi skirt. Nowadays, this would be no big deal, but back then, having all that leg was considered to be scandalous. So, as far as the hemline index is concerned, we have ourselves our first confirmed data point. The economy was up, and the skirts were up with it. How about for the men, though? Well, men's fashion throughout most of history has tended to stay pretty darn reserved. During the 1910s, men wore what would be considered today dress pants or dress trousers. Typically, they they tended to go fairly high up on your stomach, an inch or two past your belly button, and they were held there by suspenders. So how did things change as the economy improved? Uh not much. The 1920s were more of the same, except suspenders started to get phased out in favor of the new hot item in every man's wardrobe, the belt. Ooh, ah. Technology at its finest. This is also when men's pants started to have a pleat in the middle with the goal of having your nice pressed pants look flat and clean longer. As far as the length though, still largely the same as the decade prior, tapered down to the shoe. Fast forward to the end of the decade when the economic boom self-destructed. 1929 marked the beginning of the Great Depression, the worst recession in US history 
history to date. The stock market crashed, over 608 banks closed in the span of two months, and the US was thrown into an all-time economic low. So, does that mean that women's dresses also hit an all-time low? Basically, yeah. In the 1930s, women's dresses and skirts went from flapper length to just below the ankle again. Maybe not all the way back down to the floor, but certainly lower than it had been during the roaring 20s. So again, a point in favor of the hemline index. As for men's fashion in this era, everything became more relaxed. With a crashing economy, gone were the extravagant suits, starched collars, and pressed clothes of the 20s. If it looked like the aristocracy, it was out. In were softer fabrics, less structured designs. Meanwhile, when it came to the pants, the biggest change of the decade here was the inclusion of the zipper. As for shorts, well, they were kind of in a weird place. Around this time, the idea of shorts as casual clothing for either men or women was controversial. Some places even went so far as to make laws banning people from wearing them. But they did exist, and when you found them, they were usually right above the knee. Not quite Pedro Pascal levels of thigh high, but definitely a rise from the shortless 1920s. There was also a surge in the popularity of these parachute pant wannabes known as plus fours or knickerbockers. Basically, these things looked like a deflated balloon that ended mid-calf. This was likely the result of the Duke of Windsor, who liked wearing them around and was probably the most photographed man in the world at this time. So the economy was down, and shorts were on the rise. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a point for the reverse hemline index. Yeah, it's kind of bulky to say. What can we name this thing? The Shorts Standard. The Shorts S&P. Yeah, Shorts S&P. I like that. Makes it feel like Dow Jones. Next stop, the 1950s. World War II's just ended, and baby boomers are just actual babies. We all gotta start somewhere. Now, in 1942, fabric rationing for the war effort actually brought about regulations on women's clothing. In the US, there was Regulation L85, which set skirt lengths to 17 inches above the floor, meaning less fabric was being used for each new outfit. Shorter hemlines were also considered to be more practical and suitable for the wartime work and activities that women were engaged with at the time. And again, this matches our hemline index. The economy starts kicking into gear post-depression with the war effort, and as a result, the hemlines rise. But it's post-war where people started to have a lot more options for fashion. Christian Dior's The New Look was hot on the scene, a collection that was considered both classic and controversial, because it brought hemlines down away from the knee and closer to the floor. Back to the traditional way. Many groups of women actually protested against this change. They even called themselves the Little Below the Knee Club since they wanted to keep their hems, you know, a little below the knee. Probably should have called themselves the Little on the Nose Club instead. This was also the era of the poodle skirt, skirts that tended to hit mid-calf or lower and featured designs of poodles, musical notes, and other fun images. Lastly, this was the era where capri pants were first introduced, with the hems hitting somewhere between mid-calf and ankle. Basically, any way you slice it, the hems were down and legs were more covered just in time for the US to hit a big recession in 1958. Men's shorts actually got the same memo. While Bermuda shorts had been gaining in popularity throughout the 1950s, hitting just around or above the knee, cabana sets, made for lounging and looking beachy, were soaring into popularity by 1958. Just take a look at the ads from this year. Who wears short shorts? Men during times of crippling economic debt wear short shorts. These guys saw Pedro's Met Gala outfit and said, hold my tiki drink. This 1958 recession was short, lasting only until the end of 1959. But you know what? So was the men's fashion. Mark another W in the shorts S&P. By the 1960s, things had evened out, and an icon was born in the form of the miniskirt. Popularized in 1963 by British designer Mary Quant, this thing took the world by storm, taking the hemline well above the knee just in time for the strong economic growth and low unemployment of the 1960s. Meanwhile, men's shorts did unwedgie themselves and fell back down to around the knee, much more in line with what modern fashion would consider the average length of a short today. It seems kind of unbelievable, but the hemline index and the shorts S&P really do seem to be staying consistent with the economic trends. But before we speed run our way through the last few decades of data, it's time to remind you to hit that subscribe button. Things like the hemline index have been around for decades, and yet if you look around online, no one's actually stopped to look into the data about whether or not it's true. But you know who does? Us. So if you want your style to be smart in more ways than one, help us reach 2 million subscribers by gently caressing that sweet little button. I think you'll be really excited about the episode we have coming up where all of us tested how much lipstick and lip gloss you consume on a daily basis. The 1970s and 1980s were a turbulent time for the US economy. Oil crises, rising inflation costs, the lingering Cold War, all of them were taking their cut out of people's paychecks, which means that the fashion was ready to get extremely in line with the hemline index. No, really, this time period saw the rise of A-line and peasant skirts, ranging from midi to floor length. Men's shorts saw a similar upheaval, getting all up in their business. Is it KFC weekend again? Because this decade is serving up plenty of thigh. And this certainly continued into everyone's favorite maximalist decade, the 
80s. Well, the hemline stayed put, the looks, well, there's a reason the 80s are infamous for its fashion. Imagine walking into a mall to shop for your new fit and your only choices were these. Yep, that's what you got. The cut of pants were so low in this decade that in some cases, they had straps to go under your feet to keep them from riding up. That, my friends, is low. On the complete other end of the spectrum, men's shorts could not get any shorter. Are these actual garments? Or are they just tidy whities that we collectively decided were okay to wear out in public? I mean, don't get me wrong, I am all up for some body positivity there, my guys, but maybe leave something up for the imagination. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not making fun just to be fun. I'm making these jokes to hide my ever-growing fear. Theorists, I started this episode because Pedro Pascal thumbnails well, and his knees have taken over the collective internet hive mind for the past week, but I gotta say, this is starting to get a little spooky. I mean, I'm still not a thousand percent convinced that Pedro Pascal's short shorts are leading us into the economic apocalypse, but, uh, gotta admit, the evidence is a lot stronger than I would have initially expected. That said, there can't be more, right? Right? Jump forward to 2008 when the U.S. was hit with the Great Recession. I had just graduated from college, and no one wanted to hire a fresh-faced nerd with no work experience. It was awesome. And, once again, the fashion followed. At the start of the millennium, mini skirts had made their comeback, finding a way to get even shorter with the Micro Mini. Gotta say, I'm shocked that Apple hasn't released the Mini Nano. The Nano Skirt! For the shortest of the short. But by 2009, in the midst of the recession, everything changed. Maxi skirts came back and fell just around the knee. A 2012 article even wrote, quote, at 33 inches, this year's hemlines are, on average, the longest they've been since the Great Depression. So once again, the hemlines have it, at least for the ladies. As for men, eh, not so much. Throughout most of the decade, they were sitting comfortable in cargo and board shorts, loose-fitting and long. The only thing dropping there was the waistline, with loose-fitting outfits that left your butt hanging out in the open as the fashion of the day. Maybe there's yet another index buried in all this data somewhere about how the amount of butt crack your sagging pants reveal indicates a bull market. If that's the case, plumbers, man, they're making a fortune. Anyway, it's here that we hit the final stretch, 2020. With the pandemic and all the turmoil that came along with it, cottagecore was all the rage. Long skirts and big puffy sweaters to bring a sense of calm to a nervous and troubled time. Nothing says hiding from the problems of the world quite like hiding in the folds of your long and oversized clothing. Hemlines were low, spirits were low, and the economy was low. Or, more accurately, non-existent. The U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis reported that the U.S. GDP contracted by 31.4% in the second quarter of 2020, which was the largest quarterly decline on record. Makes it harder to buy things when you can't leave your house. So yet again, the hemline index works for women. As for men, well, there wasn't much to see during this period. Everyone was just wearing sweatpants, while rocking the suits and polos up on top for their Zoom meetings. Basically, it was the clothing equivalent of a mullet. Business on top, party down below. But yeah, nothing much to report when it came to men's pant length. So with all of our evidence now collected, have we proven the hemline index and the shorts S&P? Now that we've walked our way through the major periods of economic upheaval, what have we learned? As we start to hear rumblings about a possible recession in 2023, Pedro's out here bare need and looking like a bad omen for the economy. So do I finally have to cash in my GameStop stock? Wait, what? I should have cashed it in a long time ago. Darn it! I was waiting for a sign from Kim Kardashian's puffer vests. While yes, there does definitely seem to be some kind of a correlation here, I haven't really given you the complete picture. Sorry, theorists, I had to save it to the end. You see, while there are these moments where history and the economy line up, there are also plenty of times where they don't. Our depression tour only hit on the main attractions. The economy actually goes through a lot more recessions than you think. The U.S. has been in 14, that's right, 14 recessions since World War II. And fashion? It's had at least 300 seasons since World War II. Well, I can certainly sit here and pick out the moments to prove the theory, there are just as many that debunk it real fast. The 1950s, for instance. Sure, there was that short recession in 1958, but for the vast majority of that decade, the economy was great. And yet, as we discussed, hemlines were lower than in the previous decade. And again, in the 1970s. Sure, there was an economic downturn, meaning lower hems during those years, but there was an ongoing debate about the appropriate length of women's skirts at the time. Do they stay high? Do they drop below the knee? Or heck, do they drop even lower than that? All were options on the fashion table, meaning that I could have potentially made the data say whatever I wanted it to. Here's the real data of hemline length for women, and here's the US economic charts. They don't match until they do, but then sometimes they go out of cycle again, and it's all about picking and choosing your battles. Here's the thing, it's a fun theory. Sure, I find this link between history and fashion fascinating, but am I gonna call up my accountant every time I see a little bit of knee? Probably not. This is just one in a long line of ways that people have tried to use fashion to predict the future. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather get my financial advice from a data report than a runway. Though, I did hear that denim maxi skirts are making a comeback. Strap in, friends! The recession is back on. But hey, that's just a theory. A style theory! Keep looking sharp.
And hey, if you like fashion conspiracies, you should probably click the box on the left to find out why women's pockets are so small. Or if seeing the evolution of fashion through a unique lens is what you're looking for, click on the right to see how Taylor Swift's eras uncover a tragic secret. And as always, my friends, I'll see you next week.